Yesterday I released a video on combat options, and one of those options was talking about the combination of specificity and ambiguity to put extra layers in your combat. And while that was couched mainly in terms of as a suggestion of what you might try if you have a player who's struggling to retain engagement, like maybe they're the player that doesn't really like combat all that much, for example, and you can put in these extra layers of information, which aren't, obviously, specific. They're ambiguous. I wanted to highlight this option in its own video. And I'm going to do that using video from a recent solo session I conducted in our 4GM experiment using Ubiquity for All for One Regime Diabolique. This one from Ivan Mike 1968's channel, featuring Ivan as his character, Philippe. Now, in this entire session, Philippe is focused on helping out the fencing master of the school to which he belongs. He's doing a favor for his teacher and earning uh, some benefit for himself. And all he has to do is train this student who's pretending to be a little older than he is and seems to be troubled by something. So there's already hints of who is this person and, and why. Philippe, as represented, has not been a talker, has not been connecting with non-player characters very strongly, but he has, you know, risen to the occasion and demonstrated his, you know, extensive sword fighting capabilities. On one level, the events of this day are just another day in the life of Philippe, crossing steel with a variety of different opponents. But at the same time, there's a lot more going on. Things that are aimed more at the player than at the character. Things that I know as the game master the player is going to understand. Things I'm intentionally putting in there that the player will understand that will never filter down into the character. At the same time, while the character is navigating situations where he's not at his best, social situations, uh, layers of intrigue, there are opportunities for that character to rise to the challenge, to perhaps notice that there's something they're not quite getting. And so, development can happen. Now, the use of combat in role-playing games has a long and storied history, and its appearance in sessions can be for completely different reasons. There are games where there's combat because that's a part of the game. There are games where there's combat because that's a part of the genre. It's not quite the same thing. And there are games where combat is used for purely dramatic purposes. It's about revealing the process, or it's about revealing the inner life of the character, how they are affected by conflict, one type of conflict being combat. There's lots of different reasons to have combat in your role-playing session. Now we could look at Philippe and say, well, he's primarily a combative character. He is the most highly trained swordsman in the group. He has been described as being much younger and much less experienced than the others. He's very concerned about proving himself. And as this young man, this is the way he's found where he excels. And maybe through his service as a musketeer, he can you know, finally earn his place in the world. He has not been portrayed as the deep thinker, or as a brooder, or as a socialite, or a ladies' man, or, or any of these things which he could possibly grow into. We don't know who he's going to become. Right now, everything's about the present. You know, he's a thrill seeker. He throws himself wholeheartedly into things. So what purpose did the combats serve in this session? Just to entertain the player with using their primarily combat character in a combat situation, or were we getting at something else? As the Game Master, I never have to say. 
I could be simply falling back on the advice of Raymond Chandler and chucking a surprise combat in there to spice things up, and maybe at the end of the combat I can figure out what should happen next. Maybe it's commentary on Philippe. How will the character of Philippe come out of each of these encounters? He's been portrayed as being excessively worried about each minor injury, about needing to get better, to get faster, to be able to handle more and more opponents and come out of it without a scratch. He's obsessing on fighting without injury. How do each of these successive combats affect his, his image of himself? Maybe that's why these are in there. Or maybe the combats are telling a story. Now, I'm going to play a clip now, and I'd like you to listen very carefully to what gets said and what doesn't get said. And then at the end, we'll come back and talk about maybe what I was thinking. The streets of Paris are sometimes difficult to identify as being streets. Sometimes they seem like these narrow alleyways, and sometimes you just simply cannot pass what's occurring on the the, the larger roads. Hmm. And so it is that you two are, are not forced off course. He admits it's actually a shortcut as far as he remembers, but you'll have to pass through this collection of of old houses. There are upper layers built, you know, over each other, leaning over the street. It's quite dark. And uh, often there's a form of rain, which can happen unexpectedly, uh. and muck in the streets that is better left unidentified. And you'll pass through this narrow alley into a large courtyard from which several other alleys will emerge and you'll cross over to another large street and then be much closer to to your destination but he's he's hesitant about passing through but really there's no choice yeah it'll be okay it'll be thrilling it will be an adventure i love little alleys like this so he smiles and a group, as you might expect, and embrace with your thrill-seeking nature. Ah. Plus one style to you, my friend, added to the three you've started with. Excellent. Your thrill-seeking nature has led you into the grip of a gang of what look like rabble. You know, they've got muddy clothes and they're they're shoes are just sackcloth tied around their ankles and from the depths of poverty the grit is caked into their nails but philippe i would like you to check perception i will do that i'll do that uh and that would be a mighty one <laughs> okay may the dice gods be kinder to me during the fight all right. Well, that with that one success, uh, there's there's nobody hiding, right? I'll give you your 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 sense of combat. So this is a a almost circular space. You're right. Right. On the wall to your right, there's a bunch of broken barrels, wagon wheel, that kind of thing. There's a large pile of destroyed furniture and shattered wood leaning up against the wall of a building directly across the courtyard from you. There are three other exits out of here, all very narrow. Um, that pile of, of rubble, you could probably, you know, climb up it. It might shift unexpectedly underfoot, but it would give, give you access to a low hanging roof or something along those lines. All right. There's not much else in this alleyway other than than mud and an open cover into the sewers. The grate has been has been pulled up and cast aside. So there's this open almost one meter by one meter square hole in the center of the courtyard into which this filth oozes. 
<laughs> Typical. Okay. <laughs> and the the rabble, whoever they are, have put themselves into a loose crescent, reminiscent of your the meal you just ate. Huh. Delicious. <laughs> We've got no grief with you, musketeer. Leave the boy and go. Oh, I'm afraid I cannot do that. Then you can die. And they come rushing in. Okie dokie. Let's do it. And it's like 11 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> could possibly go wrong. What could possibly go wrong? Initiative. All righty. Ah, uh, two. This is our first example. And there are a few things to point out about ambiguity and specifics. So, the characters are walking down an alley, or walking down a main street. They pass an alley. The alley is indicated by Pierre, the young charge, that this would be a shortcut to their destination, but he's hesitant to go down it. This suggests he is familiar with what's down the alley. The danger is evident. He wants to go, then he recommends not going. Philippe, our thrill seeker, says, don't worry about it. Let's go. Earns himself from style. Confirmation from the game master that, yes, you've just gotten yourself into trouble. Go for it. Continue being a thrill seeker. I've got your back. So he goes in to the area where they're immediately accosted by ruffians, which could, to some players, indicate a connection. Maybe Pierre is responsible for these ruffians. Maybe this is a test for Philippe. Maybe the whole thing is a put-on. There are lots of ways to take this sudden readiness of these rabble for their arrival. They didn't notice them and rise up from positions where they were lazing about in this central courtyard. They're waiting, specifically. They identify the musketeer and tell him to, to go. He doesn't. Is this a test of Philippe's loyalty? or just his combat ability, or is it not a test at all? And is Ivan's deduction about the young man more on point? Is the young man convinced that he's being followed, not at all connected to the rebellious and vengeful relative he has, who he believes is hunting him down to kill him? Maybe it's instead related to his obvious wealth and the fact he keeps parading around back alleys, flaunting it, in front of people who are starving. The conditions in Paris at this time in history are desperate for the poor. Which is it? Or is it neither? Is it none of these things? Is it simply an ambiguous comment designed to engage the mind? When they move in, we have the courtyard. And very specific items about space and location create a sense, or attempt to create a sense, of that courtyard for the combat. But they are out of reach. And through that, and his own logic and sense, the player realizes that they can't move. They're trapped here at the front of this alley because of Pierre, the person that they have to protect. The enemy's arranged in front of them in a ring. He has to get through them. That puts them between him and the person he's trying to protect. And Pierre freezes in place. Is this because he's actually Afraid, or is this all an act? Who can say? He seemed plenty brave and well-trained in the salon, but this is real combat, and this is the realization of his fears. Which is it? Is it either? Is it none of these things? Excellent decision is made by the player, though, to hold his ground, which makes the combat even harder. So, the player has never denied the specifics of range and spatial relationships and what their options are in the space. But non-combat relevant information is also provided to give that extra layer, that layer of ambiguity about what's going on, which might help the player feel a little tension or fear or shock or concern or worry or excitement or enthusiasm or whatever beyond simply engaging in another combat scene. Combat can often be put into a game because of an expectation. We say we're playing a swashbuckling game, so that means it has to include combat. 
right? And the combat has to be over the top and excessive, right? And then we go back into the source material and we discover there's more to swashbuckling than simply a lot of sword fighting. Sword fighting is definitely important as is a sense of flamboyance and acrobatics, but there's also a very clear sense of morality, a very black and white sense of good and evil. And even the villains might have some kind of honor code and want to cess out the situation and try and get a measure of the people that are against them. It might make it possible for there to be some kind of redemption. Swashbuckling isn't just swords and acrobatics. There are other layers to it, sometimes quite ambiguous. Look at the character of Milady in Dumas' Three Musketeers. The complicated relationship she has with Athos, the complicated relationship she develops with D'Artagnan. Lots and lots and lots of things going on in the background, and often questions completely unanswered by our protagonist. It is this that we could say would be a, a, a reason to put in this kind of information to help emulate or simulate that genre. Not simply, well, I think things are kind of flagging, so I'm going to throw in a combat, although that could realistically be a reason to do it. Let's take a look at the next scene, a scene in which the characters have no reason to expect to be bothered, and bothered in a very specific way. Nobody really knows that they're together or where they've been or where they're going, and yet they are accosted, and accosted by very specific people. Ahead of you, moving with purpose, with that pointing finger of, aha, there's one, uh, three crimson cloaks advance. Oh, man. Oh. <laughs> I swallow hard and just continue advancing as if nothing's going on. My life is good. One of them calls out in a strong voice. It's not one that you recognize. It says, Philip Moreau, King's Musketeer. Ah, uh, c'est moi. Bonjour. Do you have... Is this man, they notice the boy finally, is this young man, Pierre? And who wants to know? The Cardinal. And why would he not to know that? Because this young man who you have been imperiling by walking around the city is Armand de Bourbon. And Pierre clutches your arm and says, no, it's not true, I'm not. My name is Pierre de Martin. At this point, I'm just like, oh, what the heck? <laughs> and he must so, come with us for his own protection. So I look at Pierre, like, is what he says true? No, it's a lie. I'm afraid I cannot let you do that, gentlemen. I am sworn to protect this young man, to take him home. So yeah, hands drop to sword hilts. We don't have time to fool with you. We're under the Cardinal's orders. No one will miss a musketeer, more or less. Oh, if you insist. <laughs> Is that your way of saying roll initiative? <laughs> That's my way of saying roll initiative. <laughs> and so this second example, like the first, has some things to show us. Why does this encounter even happen at all? If... I'm being ambiguous with this encounter, that's really where I want it to begin. We have Philippe, who is, as we've said, primarily a physical character. He's young and inexperienced, and he's played that way. Right? So despite what tools and talents the player has, the vehicle that he has in the scene is this you know, rather innocent, young, inexperienced, not very worldly wise character 
who is now a musketeer and is now being exposed to the sorts of intrigues and, and courtly you know, machinations that go on. He sees the complicated social relationships of Breeze Coeur and he sees the, the tension and the seriousness and the pressure building in Martin. He sees the struggle that Jean-Marie is going through. These things are influencing, affecting him and causing him to grow. But his own experiences are also important. He's got to protect this boy. Now, here they are simply walking down a the street. There's no reason for them to suspect that anyone knows where they are or that they are together. And yet, here come the Cardinal's guards. So this could be a representation of genre. We're getting close to the end of the session. We're going to end on a high note. This could be a signal from the game master that something else is going on. Somebody told, somebody knows. There's some way for them to find out about the location of Pierre. And remember, this is a supernatural swashbuckling horror game, so it's entirely possible that there's some mystical thing going on which enables them to be here. Or maybe there are squads of Cardinal's guards out everywhere. Maybe they've been searching for him for a long time, and just by luck they have cross paths, but doesn't that also imply that other groups of guards must be somewhere else? Possibly at the Renoir School. And the Renoir School, while filled with very talented swordsmen, lacks social standing. And so the talented maestro of the school might be in peril right now because he doesn't have the rank and he doesn't have the students of sufficient rank to protect themselves from this kind of social negative social attention. Is that going on? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe all of it's going on. Maybe some of it's going on. Maybe none of it is going on all at the same time. All from simply dropping this encounter into the street before them. And what will they do? How do they know what they know? In this encounter, they fight together and then escape. This provides an opportunity, again, for enjoyable combat, and people sitting on one side of the table might see it as that and only that, an opportunity to finish off the session, rolling some dice, cracking some jokes, defeating an enemy, having fun. But someone else might be putting together the connections, the implications, having concerns and worries, and wanting to get to the next scene so they can confirm those suspicions or protect their allies and friends. Like I said, some of it may be true, none of it may be true, but... What purpose does this combat serve? What Can you tell them that is absolutely true, that they can confirm with their own senses, keep that consistent, keep that real, but from that give rise to suspicion, speculation, help them ground themselves in the scene so that development, speculation, curiosity, engagement can grow. And we are told as martial artists that we should use the weakness of our opponents against them. And often on this channel, we talk about the weakness of language sometimes in getting our point across. When I say story, what you hear is likely not what I mean, and vice versa. We have to dig deeper to find out the truth. But if language itself can be a weakness, then why don't we, as game masters and players, start using that weakness to our own advantage? That's my line of thinking anyway. And so if I can produce a positive effect from ambiguity, I will. What are your thoughts? Thanks for watching.